Welcome back to this tiny little mini series about Freud's personality theories. Last week I already gave you a brief introduction into why Freud's theories were so revolutionary in his time. Then we talked about his very first model, the effect trauma model, in which he stated that external conflict in the form of trauma that was caused by the primary caregiver towards the child was very forming for the personality, which then later, unfortunately, he abandoned. I mean, this is a train of thought that is very prominent today in psychotherapy. But Freud ended up concluding that internal conflict was much more important than external conflict. That's why he developed his second theory, which is called the topographical model. And it's called topographical because he divided the personality into three layers. There was the conscious, pre-conscious and unconscious layer. And the internal conflict that was so forming for the personality happened between the conscious and the unconscious layer. So whenever something felt very scary, for example trauma, or something felt very threatening in the form of impulses that related to sex or aggression, the conscious part would repress those impulses, traumas, instincts into the unconscious part. Now, after Freud came up with this model, he wasn't quite satisfied. So the reason why Freud was not really satisfied with this model was because he realized that the defense mechanism repression didn't happen consciously. It's not like someone experienced trauma and then consciously decided to repress the trauma or that someone consciously noticed that they want to be aggressive and then they consciously said, oh no, I'm just going to repress this aggressive impulse. Freud realized that the internal conflict was not between the conscious and the unconscious part, but it happened entirely unconsciously. So that meant that Freud had to come up with a new model that included different structures that were engaged in the unconscious because, I mean, conflict can only be there if there are at least two parties to the conflict. And this is how he came up with a structural model. The structural model consists of three parts, the it, the ego, and the superego. And he also integrated that with the topographical model by stating that the it is entirely unconscious, the ego is partly conscious, partly unconscious, as well as the superego. So then you have three parts, the it being entirely conscious and the ego and the superego being partly unconscious, who can engage in internal unconscious conflict. But let's look at those three structures in detail so that you get a better grasp of what exactly he meant. As I said before, the it is entirely unconscious and it functions by the pleasure principle which again means I want it and I want it now. The id wants to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And also the id uses primary process thinking, which means that it doesn't really care about chronology, it doesn't care about reason, it doesn't care about order. It's very much driven by fantasy and very much driven by visual imagery, which maybe you can relate back to the pre-conscious and the unconscious that Freud defined in his topographical model. The next structural component is the superego. This is also only partly conscious and is often referred to as giving moral imperatives and it is often considered to be the conscience and the ego ideal. The superego generally forms because we internalize external voices. So for example, as a child, you have your parents who say, be a good person, do your homework, don't be late, work hard in school. And these external voices get internalized, which on the one hand makes you a very good citizen. It makes you adhere to the rules, to the social rules. And you don't just adhere to the rules, but also you enforce them on others. But it can also lead to the formation of the inner critic, which especially people suffering from perfectionism can tell you all about. The ego ideal then becomes the standard you measure yourself by. And for example, for people who suffer from eating disorders, especially anorectic patients, are assumed to have a very, very strong hyperactive superego who punishes them relentlessly. Now, the last structural component is the ego. And that is kind of the part that tries to mediate between the superego and the id. The word ego or the English translation of it is a bit weird because in German we would say ich and that means I. So the ego is not some sort of um, artificial construct, but it is what the person identifies as. The ego operates according to the reality principle, which means that it's rational. It responds to reason, logic, 
chronology, everything that the it does not respond to at all. Because of that, and also because it mediates between the superego and the it, the goal of any therapy is always to strengthen the ego. This model has received a lot of criticism, there's been a lot of discussion whether this model really represents personality accurately. I would always say that there's no model, no theory out there that depicts reality accurately, because there's always a great deal of subjectivity, there's always a great deal of complexity, so don't take this theory as the theory that explains everything, because it doesn't. What you can take away from it is that maybe you learn to listen more closely to what is actually going on inside of yourself, and that you realize how rich your inner dialogue and your inner conflicts actually are. That there are voices inside of you that work like an inner critic, which you might regard as a super ego, you can give it any name you want. That there might be lower impulses that sometimes you want to follow and then you don't. And most of all, I just hope it feeds your curiosity. This is not the definite truth, it's just something to enrich the way in which you look at yourself and others. So if that's what you can take away from today, then my job is done. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.